you doing tomorrow? Oh, uh, it's secret. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> All right. All right. Welcome, everyone, for the fourth, fourth, uh, yeah. Matthew Carey, New Olive Branch reading. Um, we're going to probably Sam says we're going to get through a couple of chapters today, maybe three, two, three. Who knows? But Sam, did you uh, have a, any thoughts that you thought we should have in our minds before we embark on this? No, I'll just um, watch the other three videos. Um, they've been very fruitful discussions, and um, we're going to dive in a bit more on the benefits of uh, protectionism and uh, developing domestic industry and all those good things. Good. All right. Let's do it. Okay, I think this is where we left off, I believe. Uh Yep. Chapter 12 was the last one we read. Okay, yeah. so this is chapter 13. Good. All right. So who is in a uh in a mood to read a little bit today? All right, I see Nathan's hand up. Oh, Please don't read read one, 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 one <laughs> I, I don't mind. I like I'd like to read. Sure. Yeah. Go for it. Really? Okay. Um, now I am on a phone, so, so it might be a little more difficult, but, uh, chapter, uh, 13, uh, calumnious clamor against the manufacturers on the ground of extortion, <clears throat> destitute of the shadow of foundation, take the, take the beam out of thine own eye, rise of Moreno wool, 400%. Great rise of the price of... Hmm? What? Somebody called Good, me great dog. rise of the price of merchandise after, uh, after the declaration of war. Uh, the most plausible argument used to defeat the applications of the manufacturers for relief and to consign those that have hitherto escaped ruin to the fate that has befallen so many of their brethren... Is the extortion said to have practiced during the war, which, if they have an opportunity, will it is asserted repeat. The justice of this accusation is firmly believed by a large portion of the people of the United States as Nathan, if it were so Nathan. Sorry, should I slow down? No, it's not a question of slowing yeah. down. Your re your reading is perfectly fine. It's just the quality of your uh, your your recording device. Enunciation. Yeah, your microphone oh, okay. is, too, is not cooperative, so it's going to be too difficult to follow. So okay, start it. Have somebody start at the plausible argument, and I'll, I'll let them think, take over. Yeah, let, let's let's get somebody who's got a better mic. We don't want anything. Over. No problem. Yeah. You know me, Matthew. I'll, I'll volunteer. Yeah, I think it's the internet connection. It's just dropping out a lot. Yeah. Or it could have been my Look, hand over the microphone. There's a lot of it going around, folks. I uploaded to uh, Windows 11 about three or about six weeks ago. So far, my computer has died three times. Yeah. Yeah, and the internet is in the rural areas. Bad. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for the fact that I have a friend who sort of knows what he's doing, I mean, we got lucky too. I managed to get back on and saved everything without losing any files, which is always okay. a pain in the ass. <laughs> I've done everything. I've done all the backups. I've yeah. done everything to prevent this. You know, I've got an yeah. ancillary drive. And it, well, anyway, let's not worry about that. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Nathan. I do agree with Matthew. You were very hard to follow. That's all. I apologize. No problem. Hopefully I'll come through nice and clear. Okay. The most plausible argument used to defeat the applications of the manufacturers for relief and to consign those that have hitherto escaped ruin to the fate that has befallen so many of their brethren is the extortion they are said to have practiced during the late war, which, if they have an opportunity, they will, it is asserted, repeat. The justice of this accusation is as firmly believed by a large portion of the people of the United States as if it were supported by proofs from holy writ. Great zeal and address have been employed by persons whose interests are subserved by exciting hostility against the manufacturers, to disseminate this prejudice. Unfortunately, their efforts have been crowned with success. The accusation, it is true, has been refuted times without number, but regardless of the refutation, it is still advanced. 
with as much confidence as if disproof had never been attempted and indeed as if it were impossible. Boy, is that shades of today. This reproachful charge has been recently advanced by a respectable body of planters whose opportunities and situation in life should have shielded them from falling into such an error. The General Meeting of Delegates of the United Agricultural Societies of Virginia, in a memorial adopted on the 10th of January, deprecate the idea of being placed at the mercy of an association who, competition being removed, will no longer consider the intrinsic value of an article or what price would afford a fair profit to the manufacturer, but how much the necessities of the consumer would enable them to extort. Of this spirit, we had a sufficient specimen during the late war with Great Britain. This very gentlemanly, decorous and voracious accusation is the act of various people there, esquires. I don't know whether any of that, well, Henry Jones is one name, but I don't, anyway. When these gentlemen were thus denouncing the extortion practiced in consequence of the necessities of the consumer, it is wonderful they did not pause a little and reflect on the price of $15 per hundred weight, which they received in 1818 for their tobacco, in consequence of the necessities of the shippers, whereby so large a portion of those shippers were ruined, and so many illustrious families reduced from a state of affluence to penury and dependence. They might also turn their attention to the extravagant price of two and three dollars per bushel for wheat, and eleven, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen dollars per barrel for flour. Those reminiscences would have been rather malapropo and deranged some of the flowery paragraphs of their memorials. Our own offences are easily forgotten. They are marked in sand, while those of our neighbours are engraven on marble. As the prejudice on the subject has produced the most deleterious consequences, not merely on the happiness and prosperity of the manufacturers generally, but on the power and resources of the nation, I hope for a candid hearing while I investigate it and undertake to prove, number one, that the charge is not only true, but the reverse of truth that the rise of price was perfectly justifiable and that the shadow of extortion did not attach to the procedure. Two, that the charge of extortion would apply with infinitely greater force and propriety to the farmers, planters and merchants, who in this case are the accusers than it does to the manufacturers. The accusation has been more frequently predicated on the rise of the price of broad cloth than of any other article. As in this case, it comes before us in a tangible form and subject to the talisman of figures. I shall therefore confine myself to this prominent and conspicuous case, observing en passant that the facts and reasoning apply equally to other branches. They all stand on nearly the same ground. In every case in which a rise of price took place, it arose from a cause similar to that which operated on broad cloth. Therefore, if the charge be disapproved in this instance, it falls to the ground on the whole, just as when, during the late war, several vessels were captured in circumstances exactly similar, the trial of one decided the fate of the rest. The facts of the case are superfine broadcloth was sold previous to the war at from eight to nine dollars per yard. During the war, it rose to 12, 13 and 14. On this extortion, the charges have been rung from New Hampshire to Georgia, from the Atlantic to the Mississippi. It is considered as a set off against and justification of the widespread scene of desolation, the sacrifice of capital to the amount of millions, the ruin of hundreds of capitalists and the extreme distress of thousands whose sole dependence is on the labor of their hands, on which Congress have for years looked with unfeeling indifference without taking a single effectual step to relieve the sufferers or to remove their sufferings. The value of every manufactured article depends on the price of the raw material, the cost of workmanship, and the profit of the capitalists by whom it is produced. That a rise in the price of either or both of the first two will justify a rise in the price of the article is too manifest to require proof. Now, to the senseless and calumnious outcry against extortion on this subject, it would be sufficient to state the simple fact that the raw material experienced a most extraordinary rise, as will appear from the following statement of the prices at different periods. Yeah, that's a pretty big rise in merino wool in uh, two years, isn't it? From 75 cents to 400. This alone would settle the question beyond the power of appeal. 
Let it be observed that it requires two pounds of wool to make a yard of superfine cloth. Therefore, the difference in the price of the raw material accounts for and fully justifies the rise in the price of the cloth. Two pounds in May 1812 cost $1.50. In May 1814, they averaged $7. It follows that the percentage of profit was not so great on the cloth at $14 as at eight. I do not know the expense of workmanship, but I shall suppose it $5 per yard. Any other sum would answer equally well. Interesting approach to maths, that one. So it's between um, May, again, we, we, May 1812 yeah, to May 1814. Two pounds of wool went from $1.50 in 1812 to $7 for two pounds uh, two years later. The workmanship was received equal pay, it seems. The profit thus was only a little bit higher. And the price of the cloth. Yeah, most of the cost is in the price of wool. Most of the cost, $7. Yeah. Okay. Wages too rose considerably in consequence of the increased demand for workmen. That would probably be factoring into that cost, uh, Matthew. Mm. So however extraordinary it may seem to Colonel Pegram and his friends, it is nevertheless true that a workman thinks he has a clear right to raise his wages in case of an increased demand as a planter has to raise the price of his tobacco or cotton in similar circumstances. There is, moreover, another item of considerable importance to be taken into view. Owing to the utter impolicy of our government and the want of adequate protection to the woolen manufacture, the business had not been carried to any extent previous to the war. The establishments were at that time to be erected at an enormous expense and under considerable disadvantages. This warranted an extra price in the shape of interest. I now proceed to prove that had the woolen and other manufacturers raised the price of their fabrics without any rise in the raw materials or wages or without any extraordinary expense of buildings, neither the farmer nor the merchant could justify could justly censure them without at the same time pronouncing their own condemnation. So far as respects the farmer, I might rest the question on the case stated of merino wool. The rise on this article from 75 cents to three and four dollars in two years was amongst the most extravagant advances ever known in the annals of trade. And if the charge of extortion would ever fairly lie against a rising price, it would in this case indubitably. Never was the admonition, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. More appropriate. Had the Pharisee in the gospel reproached the publican with pride, he would not have been more culpable than the farmer who raised his wool 400% and reproaches the manufacturer with extortion for raising the cloth made of that wool, 50%. Indeed, in all the exuberant stock of human folly, there cannot be found anything more extraordinary or extravagant. Big claim. But the defence does not rest on this ground alone. It is corroborated by almost every article of agricultural produce, which has always risen in consequence of an increased demand. To remove all doubt, if doubt could have existed, I state from the Philadelphia price current the various prices of four articles at different periods with the very extraordinary advances on them. So flowers gone up from five to 11 in just over a year, year and a half. Mm. Yeah, it's I mean, they're all pretty much hard double. Yeah, mm -hmm. close to double in, in some cases. Yeah. Hams, nine and a half to 14 and a half w within a few months, mm -hmm. January to October. Okay. So much for the farmers. Let us now examine how far they are kept in countenance by the proceedings of the merchants. War was declared on the 18th of June, 1812. An immediate rise of price took place in every article in the market, which was either scarce or likely to become so. Some were at once raised 50, 60, and 70%. Good old capitalism. And again, we have a whole lot of examples. All these advances took place in less than five weeks. Huh. Right. Um, again, there's some pretty considerable price rises, aren't there? 
10 per box, $28 in May 18, 12 by 18, 14, it's $50 per box. Yeah, hey, okay. Mm. This was all regarded as perfectly fair, honest, and honourable. There was not the shadow of extortion supposed to be in it. The merchant who raised his Suchong tea 50% was so deeply engaged in clearing the manufacturer's eye of the moat that he quite forgot to take the beam out of his own. <laughs> Can the citizen who buys flour at $6 and sells it occasionally in the West Indies for $20, $25 or $30 without a deep blush reproach the manufacturer with extortion for raising broadcloth from $8 to $14 when the raw material rose so extravagantly? or even had the price of the latter remain stationary. Rise of price in consequence of scarcity or increased demand is or is not extortion. This is a dilemma on the horns of which the farmers, planters and merchants are caught. If it be extortion, they have been and are extortioners in the fullest sense of the word, as they have always and always do pray, uh, raise the price of their produce or merchandise in consequence of scarcity or increased demand. That's what their theory told them to do. Indeed, if this be extortion, all mankind are extortioners. Lawyers, doctors, apothecaries, house owners, ship owners, money lenders, planters and farmers, without distinction, for they all raise their prices in consequence of an increased demand. Like I said, following their theories. If, but if this is not be extortion, as it certainly is not, then every man, woman, or child in the nation, from the highest, proudest, haughtiest, and wealthiest, down to the lowest scullion, who has advanced the charge of extortion against the manufacturers, has broken the Eighth Commandment of the Decalogue and borne false witness against his neighbour. I love these old-fashioned words, the Decalogue, Ten Commandments. I trust, therefore, that it is no man of liberality in the country who considers the subject with due attention but will allow that the incessant clamour against the manufacturers for extortion is illiberal and disgraceful to the age, utterly destitute of foundation, in direct hostility with that brotherly regard which fellow citizens owe each other, and which is the surest foundation of harmony and happiness in a community, and that it produces a system of conduct incons inconsistent with the soundest principles of political economy, as well as destructive to the permanent wealth, power and resources of the nation. Cool. Uh, Susie, I, I see your digital hand there. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got kicked out. My internet connection is unstable. I uh, want to ask, so is it because there was an increase in demand that the price of wool went up so significantly? It was certainly an expectation of an increase, the declaration of war. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there on, may on the basis on the basis of that expectation, like I keep saying there, on the basis of theory, yeah, they would. They would put their prices up in expectation of an increase in demand. Mm -hmm. okay, no. There may have been a little price gouging as well as a war. Uh, you know, as uh, people taking advantage of the situation. Mm. Is that not what he's suggesting, Sam? Yeah. No, no, not directly. He's not coming out and writing a you know five sentence treatise on exactly that, but that's certainly the, the feeling I, that I'm. I agree I'm with getting. you. That it seems to be what he's suggesting. Yeah. 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 I thought he was trying to argue against the accusation of extortion, and yet it feels like he's proving the accusation. Well, he was saying that it wasn't extortion on behalf of the manufacturers when they raised their prices because actually their okay. percentage of okay. profit went down yeah. because okay. the, right. okay. the merino wool uh, uh, producers raised their prices so much. Mm. And part of that raising uh, cost would have included uh, better wages for the, uh, for the workers too, is what right. he said. Yeah. yeah. It, it's you know the old you know chasing your tail. Is this before they talked about he talked about earlier in chapter about the not um, promoting and, and developing the merino wool industry earlier? Because um, during the, the war they would have trouble getting imports and hmm. yeah, 
you know, merino wool was like a, I believe a sheep from Spain that was highly prized for its wool and yep. was uh, actually under protectionism in Spain for many centuries that they forbade its uh, export. And you had to buy it from, uh, from Spain mm -hmm. hundreds of years before this, but it's spread all right. Uh, I won't go into it anymore. I've mentioned it before, but uh, merino wool in Australia was the, you know, I grew up being told that Australia <laughs> rides rides on the sheep's back. That was where most <laughs> of our national wealth came from. Merino wool really? is uh, a better class of wool. You get more of it from the sheep. It is fire resistant. Um, it's just a, a very highly prized fiber. Right. Right on. Continuing, chapter 14, the agricultural. The agricultural, the prominent interest in the United States. Great advantage to agriculture from the vicinity of manufacturing establishments. Trace of Aberdeen, of harmony of providence, full of lands, the result of decay of manufactures. I love that one. Great advantages to agriculture from the vicinity of manufacturing establishments. By local folks. <laughs> As the agriculturalists are now, and are likely to be for this century at least, the predominating interest in this country, sorry. That's a weird uh, bit of grammar. Yeah, I'll just read that again. As the agriculturalists are now, and are likely to be for a century at least, the predominating interest in this country, and have a decided influence in its legislation, it is of immense importance that they should form correct views on the system best calculated to promote the general welfare. And it is much to be regretted that the endeavours to persuade them that there is an hostility between their interests and those of their manufacturing fellow citizens have been but too successful. Never was there a prejudice much more unfounded or more pernicious to their prosperity and to that of the nation at large. It is proved on page 159 that the annual consumption of the city of Philadelphia in food and drink amounts to about 11 million all paid to the farmers, which is more than one fifth part of all the domestic exports of the United States for the last year. Within 10% of the whole of the articles of food exported within that year, and almost 30% of the average domestic exports of the nation for the last 30 years. That's a lot of production. To the farmer and planter, the home market is incomparably more advantageous than the foreign. Woeful experience proves that the latter is subject to ruinous fluctuations. Whereas the farmer is permanent and steady, little liable to vicissitude. One example that I would give there, because Australia, again, is full of examples, uh, even within my family, my grandmother's family, for example. Um, the family fortunes were quite literally predicated on the success or otherwise of voyages from Britain. Ships, ships that sank and, you know, you didn't have insurance, etc. Well, you're bankrupt until you can raise enough capital to buy another shipload and try again. And that was just an up and down thing, you know, for the, the, the vast majority of the 19th century in Australia. Mm. The uh, I don't know how any of you know the geography of uh, Australia, but if you go down south to where the city of Melbourne is, there's Port Phillip Bay. Okay, it's the largest bay in Australia. And if you go to the outside of that, which is called the Heads, Portsea on one side and Queenscliff on the other, join a dive club, guess where you're going to go diving? There's just so many wrecks around the entrance to Port Phillip Bay. And uh, I'm talking 100 years worth of wrecks, etc. some of them quite famous. Anyway, continuing on. Woeful experience proves that the latter is subject to ruinous fluctuations. That's what I was saying. Whereas the farmer is permanent and whoops. All right. We're just lost. Here we go. Whereas the, far, the former is permanent and steady, little liable to vicissitude. It furnishes demand for the farmer's vegetables, his poultry, his fruit, his fuel, and various other articles, which are too perishable or too bulky in proportion to their value for exportation. The income from all these forms an important item in the prosperity of the farmer. This is true even in small countries as England, Ireland and Scotland, of which every part is contiguous to or not far distant from the advantages of navigation. But it has tenfold weight in a country like the United States, of which a large and important portion is from three to fifteen hundred miles.
distant from the emporium to which its productions must be transported before they are put on shipboard to be forwarded to a market. And again, I just love these words. You suddenly understand what an emporium is. The, dif the, <laughs> the difference to these portions of this country between a foreign domestic market is probably equal to 50% of the whole profits of farming. As theories, however plausible, are liable to great errors unless supported by the bulwark of facts, I presume that it cannot be unacceptable to the reader to have these important views supported by facts of undeniable authenticity. I therefore submit for consideration the case of the neighbourhood of Aberdeen in Scotland and that of the settlement of Harmony in the state of Pennsylvania. Have we not opportunities of observing every day that in a neighbourhood of a ready market, no inducements are necessary to excite the common farmer to become industrious and carry on improvements of every sort with success. Sorry, I, I, might have, case, I, I fell off of the, the train here uh, for a moment. Well, what are we reading from now? What's he citing from? Uh, he's providing evidence to back up an argument. That's great. Okay. Some, uh, some facts. Okay. okay. And it's, comparing, uh, it's comparing this part of... Aberdeen to uh, Harmony. Uh, yeah. Okay. I thought he was quoting from some other source, but okay. All right. Okay. okay. A particular case occurs to me just now that is so directly in point that I cannot resist the temptation of producing it as an example of the rapid progress with which improvements in agriculture are made when circumstances are favourable. The town of Aberdeen has made great advances or in trade and manufactures within these 30 or 40 years past. The number of inhabitants has increased greatly within that period. Money has become more plenty there than formerly. Their manner of living is now more elegant and expensive. Articles of luxury have increased. In consequence of good roads having become more common, horses and wheel carriages have also become extremely numerous. On all which accounts, the demand for fresh vegetables has greatly increased in that place within the period above mentioned. But on account of the particular situation of that town, it was a matter of some difficulty to augment the produce of the fields in that neighbourhood and supply the daily increasing demand for these. The city is placed in the midst of a country that is naturally the most sterile that can possibly be imagined. For unless it be a few hundred acres of ground that lie between the mouths of the rivers Dee and Don, close by the town, there was not an inch of ground for many miles around it that could supply the inhabitants with any of the necessities of life. On the east is the German Ocean. On the south, the Grampian Mountains come close to the river, terminating in a headland on the south side of the harbour called the Girdleness. And on the west and north, it is environed for many miles with an extended waste, the most dismal that can be conceived, in which nothing can be discovered but large masses of stone heaped upon one another, interspersed here and there with a few bushes of starved heath or disjoined by uncomfortable bogs and spouting marshes, the most unpromising to the views of the farmer that can possibly be imagined. But what is it that human industry cannot perform? What undertaking is too bold for man to attempt when he has the prospect of being repaid for his labour? Even those dismal wastes, it was imagined, might be converted into cornfields. The ground was trenched. The stones were blasted by gunpowder and removed at an immense expense. Manures were purchased and thousands of acres of this sort of ground are now waving with the most luxuriant harvests and yield a rent from five to eight pounds sterling per acre. In any other part of the world that I have seen, it would be reckoned impossible to convert such soils to any valuable use. And the most daring improver that I have met with anywhere else would shrink back from attempting to cultivate a field which an Aberdeensman would have considered as a trifling labor. Long habit has familiarized them to such arduous undertakings undertaking which could not be attempted anywhere else, as, unless in such a particular situation as I have described, the improver could never be repaid. For in what other part of Europe could a man lay out 100 pounds sterling or upwards on an acre of ground before it could be put under crop with any prospect of being repaid? Yet this is no uncommon thing in that neighbourhood. Nor is this all. For to such a height is the spirit for improvement risen in that part of the world that they are not only eager to cultivate those barren fields, but even purchase these dreary wastes at a vast expense for that purpose. The last spot of this ground, sorry, of this sort that was to be disposed of in that neighbourhood 
was fewed off by the town of Aberdeen in the year 1773, forever, at an annual quit rent, or as we call it, fur duty, of 33 or 34 shillings sterling per acre. Although it was not then and never could have been worth sixpence per acre if left in its native state, nor could be converted into corn ground, but at an expense nearly equal to that above mentioned. Could I produce a more satisfactory proof that a good market will always produce a spirited agriculture? Hmm. It's an interesting example, isn't it? Greening of the planet, Matthew. Anyway, to this Scotch case, which is nearly as strong and conclusive it's, as the mind it's, can it's, it's interesting, too, to, to just think about the, the arguments that were developed further on by, by Henry C. Carey against those like John Stuart Mill or Ricardo, who are trying to maintain the idea that land is always more bountiful and richer at the beginning and it wears down, it like it, that it suffers the law of diminishing returns the more you, yeah. you use land in time. But he hit Henry C. Carey made the point, but it's already being developed here that no, actually, the land at, at, at the earliest stages is the least useful and least productive and it's with human human beings creating new inventions discoveries that we transform the land and make it more valuable in time it's the opposite of what the british school uh, asserts to be true with some love of entropy and uh, another little thing to add to that argument and just to follow it um, the reason uh, given here the cost of the land per acre to make it productive you had to be prepared to take this step of putting out a whole lot of money to turn that land into something productive, in other words, to grow corn, with no immediate return. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay? I mean, again, this is all American economics at its best, isn't it? Oh, yeah. We can see, we can, we can see the potential, but we're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to put something into this, i.e. some money, whatever resources, before we will see a return. And it's only because we see this as a collective thing, it's going to be bountiful for everybody. In other words, it's going to feed Aberdeen. Um, that we're prepared to do it and prove that it can be successful. Mm -hmm. Again, I mean, it, it always does come back to that. If I use the word common interest, you know, when, when you set about creating a scheme that really is beneficial to the common interest of a community, all things are possible. A good market will always produce a spirited agriculture. And the good market in this case is the local market. Mm -hmm. Anyway, to this Scotch case, which is nearly as strong and conclusive as the mind can conceive, I shall add a more recent American one, which has a peculiar interest. The settlement at Harmony in the state of Pennsylvania was begun in the fall of 1804 and is probably the only settlement ever made in America in which from the outset agriculture and manufactures proceeded hand in hand together. The progress to wealth and prosperity, therefore, has been far beyond any previous example in this country. In 1809, they built a fulling mill, which does a great deal of business for the country. A hemp mill, an oil mill, a grist mill, a brick warehouse, 46 by 36 feet, having a wine cellar completely arched over and another brick. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I screwed up. We've got to go back. Well, I really lost my spot here. Okay. There we are. Yeah. There. Another brick building of the same dimensions. A considerable quantity of land was cleared. The produce of this year was 6,000 bushels of Indian corn, 4,500 bushels of wheat, 4,500 bushels of rye, 5,000 bushels of oats, 10,000 bushels of potatoes, 4,000 pounds of flax and hemp, 100 bushels of barley brewed into beer, and 50 gallons of sweet oil made from the white poppy and equal to the imported olive oil. If this produce, of this produce, they sold 3,000 bushels of corn, 1,000 bushels of potatoes, 1,000 bushels of wheat, and they distilled 16,000 bushels of rye. In 1810, a wool carding machine and two spinning jennies were erected for the fabrication of Lord Croft from the wool of Merino sheep. A frame barn was built, 100 feet long, and a brick house built to accommodate 20 weavers' looms. After breakfast, we visited the different branches of manufacturers. In the wool loft, eight or ten women were employed in teasing and sorting the wool for the carding machine, which is at a distance on the creek. From thence, the roads are brought to the spinning house in the town, where we found two roving billies and six spinning jennies at work. They were principally wrought by young girls, and they appeared perfectly happy, singing church music most melodiously. 
in the weaving house, 16 looms were at work besides several warpers and wanders, winders, winders. <laughs> After dinner, we, I should know all this, my mother was a weaver. After dinner, we visited the soap and candle works, the dye works, shearing and dressing works, the turners, carpenters and machine makers. And finally, we were conducted through the warehouses, which we found plentifully stored with commodities. Among others, we saw 450 pieces of broad and narrow cloth part of it of merino wool and of as good a fabric as any that ever was made in England. We were told that they could sell the best broadcloth as fast as made at $10 per yard. The society now, 1811, consists of about 800 persons and the operative members are nearly as follows. 100 farmers, three shepherds, 10 masons, three stone cutters, three brick makers, 10 carpenters, two sawyers, 10 smiths, two wagon makers, three turners, two nailers, seven coopers, three rope makers, 10 shoemakers, two saddlers, three tanners, seven tailors, one soap boiler, one brewer, only one, four distillers, one gardener, two grist millers, two oil millers, one butcher, six joiners, six dyers, sorry, dresses, shearers, etc. one fuller, two hatters, two potters, two warpers, 17 weavers, two carters, eight spinners, one rover, one minister of religion, again, only one, one schoolmaster, one doctor, one storekeeper with two assistants and one tavern keeper with one assistant. I'll bet the tavern keeper made a killing. <laughs> the original stock in 1804 was $20,000 which was expended in the purchase of land and in supporting themselves till they commenced their operations. And in 1811, their property amounted to the wonderful sum, sorry, their property amounted to the wonderful sum of $220,000. Good investment. In seven years, yeah, it's a pretty decent return. And there it is laid out for you. Land, stocks, mills, dwellings, etc., and uh, various birds of animals. To this delightful picture of the blessed effects of the judicious distribution of industry, the statesman ought to direct his eyes steadily. It holds out a most instructive lesson on the true policy to promote human happiness and to advance the wealth, power and resources of nations. The history of the world may, may be examined in vain for any instance of such rapid strides made by any body of men wholly unaided by bounties, premiums, loans or immunities from government. The harmonists were two were true practical political economists. They did not, like so large a portion of the rest of the people of the United States, lavish their wealth on the manufactures of a distant hemisphere, nor buy abroad cheap those articles which they could procure at home. In the sound and strong language of Mr. Jefferson, they placed the manufacturer beside the agriculturist, and they have reaped the copious harvest which such a policy cannot fail to secure. One such practical example outweighs volumes of the visionary theories of the, these closet politicians who are the dupes of their heated imaginations. Mr. Gallatin's report on manufactures, dated April 17, 1810, contains an important statement on the situation of a manufactory in Providence, Rhode Island, which sheds great light on this subject and which is entitled to the most serious attention. In this manufactory, there were employed males, females, total of 178. Thus, out of 178 persons, there were 104 females. The report is so far deficient that it does not detail the respective ages of the workpeople. But judging from the state of other manufactories, we may assume that at least half of the whole number were children. Boom, 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 boom. So a lot of kids at work there. To the farmer, this statement presents itself in a particularly striking point of light. Of the whole number of persons to whom this manufactory afforded employment, more than two thirds belonged to the circumjacent farmhouses, who were thus enabled to gather up fragments of time which would otherwise have been inevitably lost. It is not improbable that the profits of their labour were nearly equal to the profits of the farming. I might cite the case of uh, cases of Brandywine, Wilmington, Pittsburgh, Providence, Lancaster, and a hundred other places in the United States where the establishment of manufactories by affording an extensive and advantageous market to the farmer doubled and trebled the price of the lands in their neighborhood and increased in an equal degree the comforts and prosperity of the farmers. And on the contrary, numberless, numberless instances are to be met with in which the recent decline of manufactures has reduced the lands to one third or one fourth of the previous price. 
the average reduction of the price of land in the neighbourhood of Pittsburgh is one half of what it was bought and sold for in 1813, 14 and 15. The farmers of the United States have been induced to oppose protection to their manufacturing fellow citizens, lest they should be obligated to purchase domestic at a higher rate than imported manufacturers. This erroneous policy has carried out its own punishment with it. The reduction in the price of the farmer's produce, which can be obviously traced to the prostration of the manufactories, has in many cases been quadruple the saving in the price of the articles he purchased. I take as examples raw wool and woolen cloth and suppose that the farmer could buy foreign cloth for $6 and would have to pay in consequence of protection, I would think. So uh, protecting duties Nine for American, a difference that never existed in regular trade. The prices of goods purchased at auction cannot with propriety be taken into account. They baffle all calculation. Merino wool now sells for 50 cents per pound. Of course, it would require 12 pounds to pay for a yard of British cloth. But had the woolen manufacturer been duly protected, wool would be at least $1. Thus, nine pounds of wool would pay for a yard of domestic cloth at the presumed advance of price. Let it be added, moreover, that the farmer would probably shear twice or three times the quantity of wool with the price $1 that he does at present. For had the woolen manufacturer been protected, the merino sheep, in which such immense sums were invested, would have been preserved instead of so large a portion of them being consigned to the slaughterhouse. Believing that the prejudices prevailing on this subject have done more injury to this country and more retarded its progress than all the wars it ever carried on, from the landing of the pilgrims to the present hour, I make no apology for adding another instructed quotation from the respectable writer who figures so largely in the commencement of it. Would to heaven that these farmers and planters who form the majority of the legislature of the United States were duly impressed with the soundness of his statements and predicated the laws of their country on the useful lessons they furnish the United States would then present a different spectacle from what they do at present to their friends and enemies, a spectacle of gratulation to the former and of mourning to the latter. A nation peopled only by farmers must be a region of indolence and misery. If the soil is naturally fertile, little labour will procure abundance. But for want of exercise, even that little labour will be burdensome and often neglected. What will be felt in the midst of abundance and the human mind be abased nearly to the same degree with the beasts that graze in the field? If the region is more barren, the inhabitants will be obliged to become somewhat more industrious and therefore more happy. <clears throat> Those, therefore, who wish to make agriculture flourish in any country can have no hope of succeeding in the attempt but by bringing commerce and manufactures to her aid, which, by taking from the farmer his superfluous produce, give spirit to his operations and life and activity to his mind. Without this stimulus to activity, in vain do we use arguments to rouse the sluggish inhabitants. In vain do we discover that the earth is capable of producing the most luxuriant harvests with little labour. Our own abundant crops are produced as undeniable proofs of this in vain. But place a manufacturer in the neighbourhood who will buy every little article that the farmer can bring to market and he will soon become industrious. The most barren fields will become covered with some useful produce. Instead of listless vagabonds unfit for any service, the country will abound with a hardy and robust race of men, fit for every voluble, valuable purpose, and the voice of festivity and joy will be heard in every corner, instead of the groans of misery and the sighs of discontent. The vacancy in this page may be usefully filled with an extract from Park's Chemical Essays, which bears cogently on this subject. If a line be drawn upon the map of England, across the country from Sunderland to Bristol, all the counties on the west of the line will be found to contain coal. Formerly, these were the least valuable districts and the parts of the county country which were most thinly populated. Hence, when the constitution of the British Parliament was established, the greatest weight of representation was given to the rich counties on the other side of that line. <clears throat> Whereas now, owing to the establishment of manufactures, the coal country, county, counties have become the most populous and wealthy, and the agricultural districts have either been comparatively deserted or at least have not much increased in population. 
This accounts in some measure for the inequality of our representation and shows very distinctly the value of our mines of coal and that by the establishment of manufactures, even the most sterile and forbidding district may be rendered populous, flourishing and opulent. Hmm. Great. Chapter 15. Do we want to continue? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to try and read this one. Yeah, okay. Yep, yeah, sure. Chapter 15. General reflections on commerce conducted on terms of reciprocity, highly advantageous, Commerce of the United States carried on upon very unequal terms has produced most injurious, con injurious consequences. Tables of exports, estimates of the profits of commerce, pernicious consequences of the competition of our merchants in the domestic and foreign markets, the ruin of so many of them, the result of the excess of their, member of their numbers. The extent and value of the commerce of the United States have long been prolific themes for orators in Congress and writers of newspapers, and it appears generally assumed to be only second to our agriculture and far beyond manufactures in, in importance. It has had incomparably more attention bestowed on it by our government than either agriculture or manufactures. The candid investigation of those sounding pretensions, whereby they may have the seal of certainty imprinted on them, if they be correct, or if otherwise may be reduced to their proper standard, cannot fail to be interesting. That commerce, properly conducted on fair and reciprocal terms, is highly beneficial, has never been doubted by any sound mind. It tends to civilise and increase the comforts of the great family of mankind. But that it may be, and is occasionally very injurious, is equally clear. When one nation, when one nation receives only luxuries from another and pays for them in necessities of life, or specie in raw materials, which would find employment for its own people, it is eminently pernicious. To make the matter more clear, I will suppose that England would have furnished France with her raw wool, lead, tin, iron, flax and hemp, and to receive in return merino shawls, silks, satins, pearl necklaces, diamond watches, etc. The most devoted advocate for commerce would allow this species of it to be extremely pernicious. Again, if England furnished wool, flax, hemp, and iron, and received in return even necessary articles, such as broadcloth, linen, duck, hardware, etc., it would be highly disadvantageous, as she would give the produce of the labour of five, ten, or twenty persons for that of one. But such a commerce would be transcendently pernicious if England had a large portion of her population wholly unemployed, and capable of manufacturing those articles for her own consumption. If this reasoning be correct, as applicable to Great Britain, it is difficult to prove why the system should not be equally pernicious to the United States. <clears throat> it is as absurd, as impolitic, and as, as cruel to our citizens, who are suffering for want of employment and who could manufacture cotton goods for us, to export such quantities of raw cotton and receive cambrics and muslins in return, as it would be for England to export her wool and import her wool and manufactures. Strike but here, said a general, about to offer some unpalatable opinions to a friend. As the views I am going to take of the subject of com commerce, however true, are likely to be as unpalatable to the merchants as the opinions of the general to his friend, I say to them, strike but here. I shall attempt to prove, number one, that a large proportion of the productive manufacturing industry of this country has been sacrificed to our commerce, that the commerce of the United States has been carried on upon very unequal terms, and that it has produced most injurious results upon the national prosperity, that its extent and advantages have been overrated, and that the numerous bankruptcies among our merchants have chiefly, chiefly arisen from the want of protection to manufacturers. These views are so repug uh, repugnant to the feelings and prejudices of a numerous class of citizens that I can scarcely hope for a fair discussion. More than half my readers will at, at once pronounce, sorry, will at once pronounce me deranged and be disposed to throw the book into the fire. Again, therefore, I say, strike but here. One, the sacrifice of productive industry. <clears throat> to prove the sacrifice of productive industry, I refer the reader to the tariffs of 1789 
1791, 92, and 1804. We will, he will find that the duties on seven-eighths of the manufactured goods imported into this country were originally at five, then seven and a half, then 10, then 12 and a half, and at length, 15%. The advance, not the result of the applications of the manufacturers for protection, but to meet the increasing demands of the treasury. Hence, with every possible advantage of water power, raw materials, machinery, talents, enterprise, industry and capital, until the declaration of war, three fourths of the clothing of the inhabitants of all our towns and cities were of foreign fabrics. And the wealth of the nation was lavished to support foreign workmen, and for governments, while we had hundreds, many thousands of citizens capable of supplying them, who were driven in many cases to servile and far less profitable labor. <coughs> the experience of our late war and the immense spring it gave to the industry and manufacturers of the country proved that one half the protection afforded to the merchants in the China trade would have enabled our citizens to have established the cotton and woolen branches on a liberal scale and saved many millions of dollars to the country annually. This was unhappily sacrificed by the system of low duties, which was advocated by the merchants and adopted by Congress to promote the interests of commerce. The influence of the former has been successfully exerted at all times to prevent prohibitions and prohibitory duties. The unsoundness of the policy this country has pursued by which it has been virtually placed in the situation of a colony to Great Britain and the other manufacturing nations of Europe appears palpable from the following considerations. So far as respects the cotton and woolen branches on a large scale, we were almost as completely excluded from them by the impolicy of our tariff until 1812, as if a law had been passed to render their establishment penal. This declaration may surprise, but is nevertheless susceptible of proof. The two strong facts already stated that with all our advantages for the manufacture of cotton, we consumed only 30,000 pounds in the year 1800, although we exported about 30 million wool, and that in 1812 we were so dependent on Europe for woolens that we had not a supply of blankets for our army, nor were our factories at the time in a situation to make provision for the emergency, placed the matter beyond doubt. He that will not be convinced by these facts of the ruinous poli policy we pursued and the wanton waste of our resources would not be convinced though one were to rise from the dead. The tariff of 1789, which established the, the 5% duty, might as well have had the following preface as the one which was prefixed to it. Whereas, although this country has become independent of Europe in its government and by its arms, it is expedient that it should still continue in the colonial state, so far as respects its supply of all the essential articles for comfort and convenience. Therefore, be it enacted, etc., that the duties to be levied on the importation of manufactures of cotton, wool, linen, pottery, lead, iron, steel, brass, and wood be no more than 5% ad volarum. However ludicrous this may appear, it only gives body and substance to the virtual effects of the tariff. In order to prove my second position, I subjoin a view of our exports and imports and a statement of the various species of the former for 15 years. Our exports have consisted chiefly of four different species of articles. One, necessaries of life. Food that would be. Raw materials which we ourselves could have manufactured and which constituted one fourth part of our exports. There goes all the cotton. Naval stores of indispensable necessity for the nations which purchase them. That when he says that raw materials well. we could have manufactured, he means we could have processed those raw materials instead of exporting them abroad, right? Yeah. 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 The 30,000 pounds of wool that they did uh, process compared to the 30 million that they exported. Yeah. Right, right. Naval stores of indispensable necessity for the nations which purchase them. The luxury of tobacco, which is about one eighth part the whole amount. Our imports consist principally of tea, coffee, wines, spices, cocoa, chocolate, almonds, raisins, etc., which we do not raise, and which, of course, do not affect our national industry. Spirits, sugar, cotton, indigo, hemp, malt, lead, etc., which interfere with the best interests of our farmers and planters. 
manufacturers of cotton, wool, leather, iron, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which interfere with the interests of our manufacturers, and of which we could, by proper, proper protection, supply ourselves with the greater part. Luxuries which tend to introduce extravagance and deprave our morals. Be specific. I'm curious as to what those luxuries are. Hmm. Anyway, uh, it just mind wanders off there. I just can't help but wonder what's he talking about. <laughs> if you were talking about it today, we, you know, we'd be into all sorts of dark territory, dark web stuff, wouldn't we? Anyway, you probably mean some sort of shifting. primitive form of video game. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Banned books, Matthew. Banned books. Right. <laughs> Domestic yeah, dirty, dirty, dirty magazines, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or the writings of various people that we're now investigating that were prohibited back then. Right. Domestic exports for 15 years from 1803 to 1817. So we're talking 14 years. Mm. Average 39, 39 million, nearly 40 million. A cursory glance at our exports will satisfy the reader that a few that few nations have carried on commerce to more disadvantage than we have done a large portion of ours. We have exchanged the most valuable productions of nature in the rudest state with the least possible degree of labor and received in return every species of merchandise in its most finished form, of which labor constituted two thirds, three fourths and four fifths of the value. This more particularly applies to cotton, which we have shipped at an average of about 25 cents per pound, except Sea Island, and received back at an advance about fivefold, thus enabling foreign nations to pay for the whole crop with one fifth part of it and wantonly throwing away the remaining four fifths. And a large portion of the manufacture being performed by machinery, we have given the labor of 20 or 30 persons for one. Never was there a system more admirably calculated to stunt the growth of a nation, to destroy the effect of the advantages bestowed in it by nature, and to render its inhabitants hewers of wood and drawers of water to other nations. One view of this subject is so appalling that it will make the heart ache of every man who has any regard for the real interests of this country or a wish to advance its wealth, power and resources. The increase by manufacture of the value of the raw material of cotton was in 1811, according to Kelcohen, about fivefold. Let us see the operation of this portion of our commerce tested by that scale. We exported, it appears, in 15 years, cotton to the amount of 154 million. This, according to Colquhoun, produced 770 million, leaving to foreign nations the enormous profit of 616 million, or an annual average of 41 million over 14 years. Hmm. Two thirds of which we might, by a sound policy, have retained among ourselves. Gee, that one, two thirds of which. We might have retained yeah. that's huge amounts of money huge amounts of money in those days there can be no doubt that great britain defrayed the whole expense of the war against us by the profits she derived from this single article in a few preceding years thus our short-sighted policy tends to aggrandize at our own expense foreign nations with which we have had and may have most perilous collisions it now remains to give a general but concise view of the injurious effects produced by our commerce I shall confine myself to facts of such universal notoriety as to preclude controversy. Commerce has, number one, carried away our raw materials and deluged us with manufactures, whereby millions of capital invested in manufacturing establishments have been lost. Hundreds of the proprietors ruined and thousands of workmen reduced to idleness and exposed to the lures of dissipation and crime. Subjected us, sorry, two, subjected us to an expense for foreign intercourse and for the Barbary powers to the amount of nearly $12 million of dollars in 20 years. Three, bankrupted an immoderate proportion of those who pursued it. Four, caused a war by which there is entailed on us a heavy debt of nearly $80 million of dollars and an annual interest of above $4.7 million dollars rendered a Navy necessary, which creates an expense of above $3.5 million for the present year. Given a prodigious spring to luxury and extravagance by the superfluous articles it has introduced among us. Drained away the circulating medium of the country, whereby every kind of business is paralyzed and the nation impoverished. 
rendered us dependent on foreign nations for many of the comforts and even some of the necessities of life. Yeah, coffee for one. That these consequences have resulted from our commerce, I trust will be admitted. They are considerable drawbacks on its advantages, which ought to be immensely great to countervail them. It behoves us then to examine the extent and value of this commerce so highly prized and so dearly bought. Part three, I now proceed to my third point to prove that the extent and advantages of our commerce have been greatly overrated. <laughs> to simplify as much as possible a complicated subject, I shall consider the commerce of the United States under five several heads. The exportation of our superfluous productions, the importation of necessary supplies, the carrying trade, the coasting trade, the shipping. The first is beyond comparison the most important. In it, the whole nation is deeply interested. Much of its prosperity depends on procuring suitable markets for its surplus productions. This affords a strong stimulus to industry, which would otherwise pine and languish. To enable the reader to judge correctly on this subject, I annex a table of our exports from the organization of the government. For the first six years, there was no distinction between foreign and domestic. I have assumed that there were two-fifths of the former and three-fifths of the latter, which is about the average proportion of the whole of the subsequent period. You have to read every single number. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. All right. So uh, exports from the United States from 1790 to 1819. So that's 30 years inclusive. Mm -hmm. So they've yeah, gone so... Domest domestic, foreign, and total. Um, so we can just take more like of a broad view rather than getting into the yeah. minutia. You can yeah. see like 1790 to 1800, um, which was um, uh, the first administrations with uh, Hamilton in government with Washington and then Adams. You see in the total column uh, a large increase. And then uh 1800 to 1808 um there is some increase though uh it's a bit less uh um how can i say it a bit less dramatic than what we see in the first 10 years of the country and then um going down quite dramatically before the war of 1812 Hmm. And then rising again quite sharply after 1816 uh, with the war ending. Hmm. Hmm. You've had an approximately fourfold increase from uh, 1790 to 1819. Approximately, and, yeah. Yeah, but, but you know, I mean, you know, that's an average. And as you uh, rightly say, though, uh, Sam, you know, from 1800 to 1812 in the... Uh, the, the rise of the war of 1812 and, and subsequent uh, results, you notice that the last few columns there are all massively increased. Mm -hmm. 1814, for example, domestic is only 6 million, whereas in 1819, it's 50 million. The yeah, and a there's big, a few... The war was a big stimulus. There's a few off years, which I'm not really sure about, like uh, 1808. If you see domestic or actually just total, 1807 to 1808 was a Big massive decrease. drop. What, what happened there? I'm not I'm not exactly sure. Um, yeah. Seasonal factors, perhaps. Lots of storms. Look at 1814. Maui fires, mate. Maui fires. Sorry, I'm being facetious. 1814? Yeah, well, 1814, that was that was a year of, in, of intense warfare. Um, <clears throat> maybe yeah. in the case of 1807, 1808, when uh, Europe was also fighting their Napoleonic Wars, maybe there were particularly bad moments in that year for purchasing American products that also crippled. I'm not sure. Transportation would have been a problem too, maybe. Just getting it to Europe is what I'm saying there. They're in the middle mm -hmm. of a war, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That, uh, I, I still look at those figures and I, I go back, you know, many, many years, you know, studying economic statistics years and years ago. A fourfold interest in, uh, increase in 30 years would be regarded, I would think, as a pretty solid increase in a relatively new economy like the United States was then. 
Whatever the reasons for the up and down in specific instances, and we've just outlined the, uh, you know, the effects of the 1812 war, nonetheless, from 12 million to 50 million in a 30-year period does suggest that the nation was at least expanding, expanding. Mm-hmm. Fourfold in 30 years is pretty good. Mm-hmm. I mean, wouldn't you love returns like that these days, eh? What would the capitalists be doing? Boy, they'd invent a new brand of champagne just for themselves. <laughs> okay, the surplus productions of the United States the great and legitimate basis of our foreign trade are, as appears from this table, far below what might have been expected from the population and the resources of the country. They average, as we see, only about $35 million or about £8.5 million sterling per annum from the organisation of the government to the close of the last year. The average population of that period has been about 6.5 million souls. It therefore appears that we have exported only about five dollars and a half per head of our whole population. I'm curious here, Sam. That figure, six and a half million souls, is that the average population of the entire United States? I believe yes. so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that's yeah, num- okay. Yeah. That's that's yeah. a number for eighteen hundred. Yeah, I don't want to get sidetracked, but boy, one can have a fascinating discussion about population increases in the nineteenth century in America based on prosperity. Well, from 1800 you, you to really 1900, could. 1800 is about 6 million, 1900 is 76 million. Yeah. Yeah. And then the 20th century. And what are you up to now? 330 million, 350 million? Yeah. Yeah. Huge increase. Anyway, uh, it therefore appears that we have exported only about $5 and a half per head of our whole population. This nearly corresponds with our recent experience. During the last five years, we exported of domestic productions about $305 million or $61 million per annum. Our population during that period has probably averaged about 9.5 million souls. So we've already had a one-third increase, which gives an export of only $6.5 per head. It is thus indubitable that this department of our commerce, obviously the most important, has been vastly overrated and sinks into insignificance on a comparison with our domestic trade, which, as may be seen, page 158, is nearly 1,500% beyond it. The food and drink of Philadelphia, New York, Boston, and Baltimore, supposing them to contain only 370,000 souls at a quarter of a dollar per head daily, amount to nearly as much as the average of the whole of our domestic exports. Hmm. Boom. $33 $33 million. Yet there are hundreds and thousands of citizens of the United States that are unalterably convinced that the United States owe all their prosperity, all their improvements, all their wealth to commerce. I have in vain sought for a general statement of our imports. It is not to be found either in Sabre or Pitkin. The former, however, gives one for seven years, from 1795 to 1801. From 70 million to 100, in 1801, 111, a total of 576 or an average of 82 million. It is not easy to calculate the amount of foreign, I think that's the next word, goods consumed in this country. The foreign exports for the preceding seven years were $236,792,386 dollars. Deducted from the above sum of $576 million, there is a balance for home consumption for that period of $340 million, being an average of above $48 million. But during this time, our commerce was far more flourishing than in other years. I shall, therefore, assume an average consumption of foreign merchandise to the amount of $40 million per annum, which will not be regarded as far from the fact. Dr. Seabert has hazarded a calculation that the profits of navigation are at the rate of $50 per tonne, and he therefore sets down an average annual profit of $34 million, which would amount to $1 billion, $500 in 30 years. Cool. It is easy to perceive how extravagantly erroneous this calculation must necessarily be. A vessel of 300 tonnes would make, by freight alone, a profit to her own uh, annually of $15,000. Yet many of our merchants have had two, three, four, five, and six vessels of this size constantly employed for years, 
have not lived extravagantly and yet have finally become bankrupt. Were the doctor's statement correct, the great body of ship owners would have become as wealthy as Cosmo de' Medici. 10% is regarded as fair average of the profits of commerce. For freight, I shall assume an equal sum. Hence is deduced the following result. Average annual domestic imports of 35 million, foreign goods consumed here at 40 million, total of 75. 10% profit, 7 million. Add an equal sum for profit on freight, another 7 million, and you've got 15 million. The carrying trade is far less important. Without much participation in it, the nation might have enjoyed and may still enjoy a most enviable state of prosperity. And it will probably appear in summing up its advantages and disadvantages during the whole of our career that the latter greatly outweigh the former. To form a decision on this point, it is necessary to ascertain its extent. It consists of two distinct branches. In the first, the foreign merchandise in transit to touches at our ports. In the second, the voyages are made from one foreign point to another. Of the first branch, we have an accurate account. The Treasury returns distinguished between the exports of foreign and domestic articles. But of the second, we can only form an estimate. The foreign exports from the United States, as appears by the preceding table, have averaged 28 and a half, nearly $23 million per annum for 30 years. It is probable that the other branch of the carrying trade is about one half this amount. Some intelligent merchants whom I have consulted estimated it from 10 to $15 million, uh, million dollars annually. But to afford the utmost latitude to the contrary side of the equation, I, I, shall, sorry, I shall suppose it equal to the other branch. Thus then stands the account of the carrying trade Foreign exports, 23 and a half, voyages from one port, same figure. Profit of four, nearly five. Total profit of the carrying trade is nine and a half. Summary, profits of trade in exports and imports for home consumption is 15 million. Of the carrying trade, nine million. And of the coasting trade, supposedly three and a half. These profits are the utmost that can be claimed on the most liberal calculation. But I must observe that it is difficult to conceive that half of them could have ever accrued, as so large a portion of the merchants who are supposed to have acquired them have been reduced to bankruptcy. This strong fact is utterly incompatible with the idea of such profits, and I am persuaded would warrant a reduction of 50 or 60 percent of the amount. The offsets have been immense. Shipwrecks, falling markets, and depredations to the amount of probably 100 millions by the belligerents under orders in council, decrees, etc. The aggregate of all of these would, would probably amount to 30% on the assumed profits. But even admitting that the whole sum of 28 millions has been gained annually by commerce, it is worthwhile to consider whether it has not been like the Indian's gun. It has cost us from 1796 to 1815 for foreign intercourse, 9 million, nearly 10, Naval Department 52, Barbary Powers 2, War Debt 78 and a half, a total of 142 for an average annual account, 7 million. The expenses chargeable to this account at present and likely to continue are interest on war debt, nearly 5 million, Secretary's estimate for the Navy 1820, 3 and a half million. This is above 25% in perpetuity on those profits of commerce, which are supposed to have accrued during the whole of the period in which it had every possible advantage that its warmest advocates could desire. It is, moreover, nearly 20% of the whole average amount of the exports of the country embracing the period in which our staples commanded exorbitant prices, which we are never likely to receive again. I therefore confidently rely that those who have con condescended to hear, though they may have struck, will however reluctantly acknowledge that at the touch of the talisman of truth, the boasted advantages of commerce have greatly diminished in amount and that it has indubitably cost the country more than it was worth. Yeah. In taking an account of the numerous offsets, the collisions with the belligerents, the chief part of the expense of the Navy, our war, the war debt and its interest, it would be unfair not to draw a line of distinction between the different branches of commerce. 
<clears throat> that important one, which consists in the exploitation of our surplus productions and procuring necessary supplies in return, ought probably to be exonerated from any portion of those heavy items. It might be carried on for a century without producing any of those consequences. They have sprung almost together from the extraneous trade in the colonial productions of the belligerents, which arose from the general state of warfare of Europe and from the cupidity with which it was pursued by our merchants. If this point of view be correct, then the account is reduced within a narrow compass. It may be useful to hazard a calculation on the present and probable future profits of commerce in order more fully to prove my position that it is cost too dear. The domestic exports of 1819 were 50, close enough to 51 million. Foreign exports were 19. Foreign goods consumed here, suppose, were 60 million, a total of 130 million. As our markets have stood lately, a profit of 5% is a large allowance. Six and a half million profits on freights, one million. Coasting trade, one and a half for a total of nine. Thus, it appears that for every dollar of the present gain of the merchants by commerce, the nation at large pays nearly a dollar of tax entailed in it by that commerce. I now invite the attention of the reader to my last position, which is that the numerous bankruptcies among our merchants have cheaply arisen from the want of protection to manufacturers. That an immoderate number of our merchants have been reduced to bankruptcy is universally admitted. The exact proportion cannot be ascertained. It has been carried as high as nine-tenths. This, I believe, extravagant. I assume two-thirds, which is supposed to be a low calculation. It remains to inquire how this cal calamitous result has taken place under what is so generally styled a flourishing state of our commerce. Various causes have conspired to produce this effect. Commerce in this country has partaken of the nature of a lottery. The prizes were often immense but rare, the blankets numerous. It has been attended occasionally with immoderate profits, which have been succeeded by great losses. The profits fostered a spirit of extravagance and luxury, which wasted all the previous temporary advantages and rendered the merchants unable to contend with the storms of advers adversity. The chief source of the misfortunes of our merchants has been the extravagant number of them, which has proceeded from the ruinous policy of our tariff, as I hope to make appear. Right. Had the great lending, uh, sorry, great leading manufacturers of cotton, wool, iron, and with some others which were arrested by forest importation, been duly protected as a sound policy dictated, during the 30 years of the existence of our government, thousands of young men in every part of the United States who have been brought up to the mercantile profession and increased its numbers immoderately would have been devoted to those branches. Many parents have destined their children to the pursuit of commerce, merely for want of other suitable employment, and without either the talents, the credit, or the friends requisite. Hence, most of our merchants have generally had two or three, and some as many as four apprentices, who, when free, have become supercargoes or commenced a profession for which they were wholly incompetent, and thus added to the long list of bankrupts. The effect of this state of things is, that there are probably more shipping and importing merchants in the United States than in the British dominions in Europe. Almost every little port from Passamokadi to St. Mary's has its body of merchants and importers, more or less numerous, who are constantly supplanting each other in the home and foreign markets to their mutual ruin. The West Indies have thus proved the grave of the former, of the foreign, Fortunes. fortunes and happiness of half the merchants that have carried on trade with them. Jesus, half the merchants, that's a lot. The trade to that quarter affords neither certainty nor security as the prices are constantly fluctuating. The markets are either overstocked or visited by a dearth. When the latter takes place, prices rise extravagantly. Intelligence arrives in this country. Our markets are crowded with shippers who outbid each other and raise the prices. Vessels are dispatched from all our ports with full cargoes. The first, perhaps the second or third, is sold at a great profit. The glut sinks the price, and all the remainder sell at and often far below cost. The business is almost wholly a lottery or species of gambling. 
regular commerce disclaims it altogether. Hmm. The price of flour in the West Indies frequently rises and is frequently falls to the amount of three, four, five, and six dollars per barrel in the course of two, three, or four weeks. Hence, the merchants whose vessel sails at the rate of nine knots an hour often makes a fortune, while his less fortunate neighbor, whose rate of sailing is only eight knots, is ruined. Timing is everything, folks. Like I said, I'm full of family tales from my grandmother about exactly how that affected her and her other eight siblings during the entirety of their childhood. Hmm. <clears throat> they were rich every time the boats landed and poor every time they got sunk. Thus, the inordinate competition at home and abroad has produced the effect of obliging the merchants to buy our staples dear and sell them cheap. The competition likewise operates ruinously in the purchase of return cargoes, the prices being thereby greatly, therefore greatly, thereby greatly enhanced. These are among the most striking causes of the ruin of so large a portion of the, manu of the mercantile class and has obviously resulted chiefly, if not altogether, from the depression of manufactures. I offer a calculation on the subject, which, even if somewhat erroneous, may prove useful. Suppose the whole number of merchants in the United States since the year 1789 to have averaged constantly 18,000, and that two-thirds of them have failed. Had manufacturing establishment been properly patronised, there would probably not have been more than 12,000 to the mass of whom the profession would have afforded a decent subsistence. In this case, it is probable that the bankruptcies would not have exceeded 2,000. Of course, 10,000 would have prospered out of 12,000, whereas only 6,000 have succeeded out of 18,000. Whatever deduction from or addition to this calculation may be made, the inference cannot fail to be highly favourable to the general scope of my argument and to pronounce a strong sentence of condemnation on the ruinous policy this nation has pursued. Another view may be taken of the subject. It appears that a large portion of our commerce consists in the transportation of the merchandise and manufactures of other nations from the places of production to this country and hence to those of consumption respectively. But might not our merchants employ themselves as well in lending facilities to the industry of their fellow citizens as to that of foreign nations? Would not broadcloths from Young's or DuPont's or Shepherd's Manufactories or shirtings and sheetings from Schenck's or from Waltham load a vessel as well and pay as good a freight as from Leeds or Manchester? Would it not be at least as profitable to themselves and as useful to their fellow citizens and to their country to export cargoes of homemade goods to South America and import specie, as to deluge their native country with foreign goods, drain it of its specie, and destroy its productive industry. Mm -hmm. As I believe that the want of correct views on this point has been among the primary causes of the present distresses of the country, I hope to be pardoned for one more presenting it to the reader, for once more presenting it to the reader. The idea that the want of production protection to manufacturers has proved highly pernicious to the merchants by an undue increase of their numbers will appear, will appear plain to those who reflect that when by the restrictive system and the war, there was a market open for and protection afforded to domestic manufacturers, great numbers of respectable merchants in all our cities devoted their time, their talents and their capital to the cotton and woolen branches very advantageously for themselves and for the country. While this protection continued, but ultimately to the ruin of many of them. It is obvious that the inducements to commence a career in manufacturing are greater than to quit another business and enter on this at an advanced period of life. And there I, I think it irresistibly follows that the successful opposition to the establishment of manufacturers has been the great cause of the super superabundance of merchants and that from this superabundance has flowed the bankruptcy of so large a proportion of them. Structural inequalities. It is frequently asserted that though, sorry, so many of the merchants have been reduced to bankruptcy, the country has gained even by their ruin. This doctrine, which I have tried to develop, I do not understand. Let us investigate it. Suppose a farmer to sell 5,000 bushels of wheat at $2 per bushel. The miller grinds it, pays the farmer, and sells the flour to the merchant who sells to the shipper. 
the latter becomes bankrupt and pays three, five or 10 shillings in the pound, as the case may be. Of course, the flour merchant suffers a heavy loss. I cannot see how from a transaction of this kind, which is an epitome of the large proportion of our mercantile business for years past, the country can be said to have gained. Money, it is true, is put into the pocket of one man, but it is withdrawn from the pocket of another. There is no increase in the, of the national wealth. Having in this chapter taken, wholly, taken ground wholly new, with no former lights to illuminate my path, I may have occasionally wandered into error, but I trust the wandering, whatever it may have been, has not led me far astray, and that the positions I have assumed and the inferences I have deduced, if not wholly right, are not materially wrong. Mm. Oh, wow. Yes, I mean I'm really glad we were able to get through that. That's a difficult chapter, but um, we're getting towards the end now, and the, the upcoming chapters uh, are much easier and shorter. But uh, we see like a um, an early example of um, first of all the the harmony of interests and for example where he um, mentions the benefits to people in shipping uh, would uh, that that promotion of manufacturers would would have for them in terms <laughs> of um, uh more uh business for people involved in the business of shipping so it's not just protection of manufacturers is not just about benefiting manufacturers but that all portions of the economy are benefited when you have a strong uh domestic manufacturing base and you also see a lot of parallels to today where he argues against the superabundance of commerce, much like what we have now, where our manufacturing base is gutted, but we have a superabundance of financial services and things like that. All the tallest buildings in every city are all banks now. And um, it's argued that just pushing this money around from one bank to another, all this financial activity is making us rich. Hmm. So... Uh, <laughs> making some of us rich yeah but it's to the great detriment of the the country in general um you know we don't we don't make anything anymore and our 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 sovereignty is greatly impacted when we aren't making for ourselves anymore and when we don't control our own money anymore uh, you can't really even call yourself a sovereign country anymore. He does mention uh, it was a nascent industry at the time, the naval industry, but he also mentioned the fact that it was completely very, very wasteful to take a large amount of the uh, American produce and ship it overseas using foreign vessels. And the example he gave was that if you put them on American vessels and ship them to American ports, to enable processing of those things, that, you know, ourselves, we would be a much greatly enriched nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and where he says uh, those shipping uh, companies, they could instead have been exporting our manufactured goods to yeah. South America and bringing back gold. And instead we are uh, importing, the, sh the shipping companies are still making money, but they're importing foreign manufacturers and our gold is being sent out of yeah. the country. I mean, it was a convoluted, uh, I mean, it's kind of interesting me reading this because, you know, with a background in economics years and years ago, I can actually read all of this and make sense of it perfectly, which is more than I'm able to do, Quan, when we're doing the philosophic discussions. Um, so I've actually enjoyed this reading immensely. I feel like, uh, yeah, I, I kind of understand everything that he's saying, and which is why I've taken time out to make some comments every now and again. So excuse me for that. If that was no, a difficult... If that was, if that was a difficult chapter, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm enmeshed in it. You know, I'm reading through it going, yeah, I understand this perfectly. And there are so many uh, examples that you could draw on today, the same sort of thing happening. I mean, the comment that I made about, you know, act locally, et cetera, was in reference to the comments that he made about shipping stuff off in foreign uh, vessels to foreign nations rather than doing it locally and bolstering the, uh, the emerging economy. Well, Pond, that's because you have an inner common sense 
<laughs> I'll go with that one, Kwan. <laughs> well, I think that, yeah, that, that is an important thing. I, I, I admit that I, I would often, this is probably one of the most challenging ways of thinking for me uh, for many years, reading Hamilton, reading this sort of material, but that it, it's only when I started getting better into the habit of, always thinking about well what's the what's the point he's trying to say because he has everything he says is said for a specific reason and often we get a little caught up in the detail the statistics the minutia and we lose sight of well what's his point and then by reminding ourselves oh yeah that's the point he's trying to draw it's a very clear point we know the, the basic terms and conditions of the free trade money worshipers who who end up increasing the middleman and destroying the the producer Okay, we know that that's the case, and we know the 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 Hamiltonian protective tariff system and the and the idea of a national bank, and we know that that's that's ultimately the side he's on. And then you could sort of make sense very quickly whenever we fall off the path. That that that's at least in my experience for myself to get back on the right yeah. the right track. Yeah, look at look, that's he true. makes lots of examples there that I think that are worth noting. I mean, it starts off as a bit of a polemic against the agriculturalist versus the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in a very, and I'm being very simplistic here, but let's just simply say the South versus the North, okay, which plays out in the future of America, not the period we're looking at now, but in the future, I'm thinking the Civil War. Let's just be simplistic with that. Agriculturalist versus merchant uh, uh, manufacturers. But he then goes and, and, and gives you a wonderful example of how even the manufacturers, okay, the merchandisers, commerce, shot themselves in the foot because too many of them did not become actual manufacturers, but essentially mm -hmm. set up emporiums and became the middlemen. You know, yeah. what today we would call, um, um, what is it? Not, not the retailer, but the uh, wholesaler. And too many of them got into the industries because they figured they were going to get rich and too many of them went broke. I think the example he gave just, just before the end of that chapter, you know, 12,000 of them went broke when 2,000 of them might have gone broke if 10,000 of them had decided to become manufacturers, got mm -hmm. involved in the manufacturing of things and then move that to the Emporium where 2,000 people can handle all of that traffic quite comfortably. So it, it, it's interesting. It's, it's, not a, it's not an either-or thing. It's not just agriculturalists versus manufacturers. It's... Right. The the uh, I, I can't help it. I come back to they the um, to the idea. Yeah, I, I keep coming back to the idea of self interest. When you only see your self interest as being yours and that's it, you're not acting on behalf of let's say the nation or of the wider community you live in. There is just so many ways in which that can screw things up, and yeah. it's that I you know know Matthew that in a lot of your speeches you're always talking about this sort of thing, isn't it? We need a nation. We need to be united around a a theme, a, 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 you know, something that, that, that binds us together as a nation, whereby we see the interests of our neighbours as being as viable as our own personal interests. Uh, that's the golden rule. Yep. Um, well, it yep. starts with the word sovereignty also. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to keep on with sovereignty because uh, let's, I, I would say that if we, uh, we, we try to have the essence of the last 15 to 16 chapters, there's only one theme who is repeating, okay? We lose money because we export our raw material for almost nothing, okay? There's a, a line where it is precise that uh, the U.S. lost maybe two-thirds of the revenue because of uh, mm. uh, too much export of raw material that is not manufactured in the U.S. But what do you think, what is that situation reminding you guys of? <laughs> situation in Africa uh, right now. Niger, okay? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, so, and Gabon now, mate, and Gabon. Uh, so, well, all of that. but I would say that epistemologically, there's a small difference between the uh, people living in the US in 1800, okay? Because uh, they had a certain level of technological development that most African nations do, don't have nowadays. Uh, taking into account the correction for the two century uh, between 800 and 2000, of course. And, but uh, you have, either you have to develop your own technology or you have to get some friendly countries uh, willing to transfer you some technology. 
Okay, uh, there's no, or you, you steal it. <laughs> okay, so, but uh, in order to steal technology, you need some people having a certain technological advancement because it's not so easy to steal technology if you don't have at least a certain epistemological development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because after all, this, this, the history of mankind has been a succession of technological theft okay uh, or transfer if we want to be uh, polite here's a very interesting uh, example that i was reading about shortly before we came on this morning and it's the chip industry in china of which matthew you probably got a lot more knowledge than i have but it was only about two years ago i think that biden et al banned china and i'm talking about uh, um uh, what's the phone company who i when they banned that from America, okay, uh, on, on the uh, pretense that, uh, um, you know, they would be looking to enhance their technology at the expense of the West, et cetera, et cetera, and that would be done through insidious means, um, spying, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in the two years since, China has simply set about recreating its own chip industry. And then now, well, you know what? They're now on you the know, verge of superseding the United States in less than, and the way, in two, I almost used the F word then, <laughs> in two <laughs> years, they have managed in much the same way that Russia has managed to overcome all of the sanctions problems, et cetera, et cetera, in two years. The Chinese have managed to not only create a new industry, but to surpass the one that was banning them. So, uh, Paul, what is the magical word that you have to say now, Paul? It's start with an E. Uh, no, I can't think of it straight off my head. Come on, come on. Uh, uh, oh, epistemology. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Okay. I, I, I don't want to use the words, I don't want to use right thinking. I'll go with correct thinking or smart thinking. Epistemological yeah. smart thinking, yeah. Uh, absolutely. It's always the basic foundation, okay? Because I said as a, as a kind of joke, but it's not a joke, okay? Because if you want to steal technology, if you want to copy technology, well, mm. you have to be at a certain minimum epistemological level to indulge in that kind of activities. Mm. Yeah, China in the 70s and 80s becoming the production giant of the whole world. What did they get out of that? Well, they lifted the standard of living of a lot of people, even though we would have judged their working conditions as absolutely horrendous. But they got industrial knowledge and they built on it. They did something with it, which explains the miracle of China's development over the last 30 years. Yeah. And I'll, I'll continue on here because I find it fascinating and I think it supports the, the overall argument, the difference between open and closed systems. History, when you look at it, if you don't learn from what you see, you're condemned to you know, repeat, repeat, repeat. I made the comment about the population of America at a specific time. Now, my understanding is that during the 19th century in particular, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Matt, almost all of the massive development of America's technology, of its industry and of its population was done during times in which the politics of the country was more uh, an open politics, if you like, and by politics, I do mean the economy as well. Okay, where you had this open approach, where there was an investment in the nation as a whole. Now, I can't be specific and give you exact years and everything like that, but that's my memory of what I learned about the development of America economic history in the 19th century. And it continued in the 20th century to some degree, too. Yeah. And you know, I mean, the, the, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I Go say on. that you're ready now for the expression in two words. It start, the first word starts with an A and the second word starts with an O. Um, aristocratic and oligarchy. Yeah, thank much, you, yeah. Sam. Mm -hmm. Thank okay, you, yeah, Sam. Okay, yeah. Because what thank I was you, what I was going to say that there will always be people who wants to be merchant in any nation. Okay, yeah. because what is interesting in Matthew Carey's uh, book is that he say, well, you know, there are people who would want to make uh, big money and quick bucks with the being by being merchants and by extracting some difference okay and that is okay that they, there are people who wants to be merchant and have, making big and fast bucks but you need an aristocratic oligarchy thinking to the national interest and protecting the essential sectors okay nowadays we would say the essential technology but i would say that essential technology would be a, an acceptable expression too in the 19th century 
Okay, if I can jump in here, I wanted to try to clarify some of what we were reading. Because back a few pages, he said this thing about everybody thinks that their prosperity is dependent on commerce. So I was looking for the answer to that question that I was hearing there. If it's not dependent on commerce, what is it dependent on? And the answer to that is manufacturing, correct? Mm -hmm. What he was trying uh, to say was that we needed to protect manufacturing and encourage more manufacturing, right? Yeah, and yeah. also I think a corollary to that is that with a strong manufacturing base, actually the commercial mm -hmm. portion will actually do better. And I really okay. identified with something that he said about how there was this super abundance of people going into commerce because there weren't any jobs for them in, you know, productive in manufacturing, manufacturing, which I see a ton of in the West now as well. Like I, right. I went to school for engineering largely because of the influence of meeting Matt and getting steeped in all of this and gaining a deep appreciation for advancements in science and technology. And I got really into nuclear power. Hmm. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, I, I, there was a famous uh, news article that came out uh, maybe last year where they were interviewing young people in China and they wanted to be astronauts and young people in America who wanted to be Instagram influencers. <laughs> and like, because they don't have the opportunity to be astronauts. They don't have the opportunity to work in advanced manufacturing, in advanced scientific and technological fields, because we don't do that anymore. We do Wall Street, we do like financial services mm -hmm. and, and Walmart. service sector economies. You could go be a waiter. You can go be, you know, uh, make reels on Facebook. Go be a YouTuber. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of parallels in what we read there with, mm. with today. It yeah. is so sad. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other uh, parallel, and uh, I'll just mention it because he mentioned it himself too, was the... Uh, the importing of luxurious goods that, that only a few needed and was, in, in essence, as he regarded it as a waste of resources. Those yeah. resources could have been put to better use is really what he's saying. Yeah. yeah. But I would say I have nothing, again, luxurious goods, as long as the core essential of the industry is protected by that aristocratic oligarchy, precisely. And the other role that the aristocratic oligarchy has to do, as Sam rightly stressed, is to protect a high quality education and the possibility of many uh, technical and highly advanced professions. Mm -hmm. okay? Because if you don't have a group protecting that kind of stuff, don't wait for foreigners to, to protect you. Because I want to remind the, the, the 12 words that we read maybe two weeks ago, uh, England never suffered foreign powers or combination of foreign capitalists. I think that we have to put it at the first page of the book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. They were in a privileged he's position. also making the point in here, is he not, that we need to not be exporting so much of our raw goods, but we need to be doing the value added processes ourselves. Right. Correct? Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Which is what same, African same nations today. are saying right now. Yeah, yeah, and we we should say the same thing in Canada. I mean, we are largely a resource exporting nation ourselves. There's some advanced manufacturing here where I am in Ontario, although it's 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 tough than it has been in previous decades. There used to be a lot more in Montreal where Matt is. It all headed down the 401 to Ontario after the referendum in 95 um but you know largely 
Canada is an exporter of raw materials still. Australia, likewise. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's absolutely flabbergasting. Okay, <laughs> that, that countries like Canada, Australia would be simply yeah. a wilderness uh, yeah. for commodities. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you betcha. Well, his, his remarks on on abundance, like how you can live in scarcity when you're when you have abundance all around you, um, it's it's so, it's so prescient uh, that that he's trying to just shake people in the world that he's living in in the 1820s out of this the stupidity. And, and you just look at how applicable this criticism is for our world today, too. And I mean, to say that we were we're running into an energy or food shortage anywhere in the the modern world with modern technology is absurd, but especially a place like Canada. Which is just, I mean, the bounty is is incredible. Yeah. And yet we're being buy this book. Both can, countries. Can you buy this book? The the new olive yeah. branch? Yeah. You can download it. You you can buy it too on, on Amazon, although uh it's fairly expensive. Because it's quite rare now. Oh, so it's like a used book or something? It's not being published anymore. Yeah. Oh. And okay. um and you can find it for free on archive.org that's where we got these uh, pdfs i can actually I'll, I'll post a link in um in the chat susie yeah it it hasn't really been republished over the years there is a paperback actually yeah there is a paperback edition that's been uh i think somebody republished it for $20 so you can actually get it the the quality wow. of the printing is probably not going to be that impressive um but if you want a physical hard copy it, it's available on Amazon yeah my wife bought me a, a reprinting of the first olive branch hmm. on Amazon and it's like it's like a <laughs> scanned pdf and yeah. it's got like these dark splotches all over it that's just unreadable in lots of different parts it was really sad luck it was like thirty dollars. It wasn't a lot wasted, but okay. yeah, it was not a it was not a great printing. So watch out. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's a lived experience because um, everything that we're talking about, I, I literally lived through. I grew up in an Australia when I was younger, where almost everything was uh, in public hands. So mm -hmm. most of our public public transport was extensive. The city of Melbourne has a wonderful railway system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, about policing, uh, communications, uh, energy. We, we were world leaders in, in a number of areas, developing telephones, for example, and designing the old rotary ones. We came up with some of the best. And so many of these you know, NGOs were self-contained. So the energy companies were looking for ways to improve what they did. The telephone companies, the Australia Post, were looking for ways to improve what they did. Whatever profits that they got that weren't shoveled back into government coffers, there was always an amount left over to, to improve, you know, R&D, et cetera, et cetera. And then beginning in the 80s, we started to flog off every single bloody asset in a massive privatisation thing that has just gone absolutely nowhere, impoverished the nation and turned us into, you know, kind of like a, some of the African nations. All Australia does now of any real value is dig holes in the ground. We're still exporting a shitload of coal to China mm. and India. And that's uh, what we live on. That, that's, that's our national wealth. I mean, I remember as a kid, we had factories that made shoes, and shirts and clothing and just about everything that we need. You know, the national food stuff, Diet Vegemite was owned by an Australian company. I think it's owned by Unilever now. Um, so much of what was going on around you in terms of just your daily life was you know 90 percent the productive effort of the nation in other words public enterprises and 10 percent what was going on with you know private enterprises now it's gone full tilt in the other direction and there are nothing but troubles in every one of those areas in every one of those industries yeah but you're getting break that breakdowns in the signaling for example in uh, uh, railway lines in uh, um, new south wales because the company that bought it privatized it put to no money into maintenance of course, of course. I mean, we haven't had any major, absolutely major train wrecks yet, but we've come close. Two I mean, days in after a, I in was a, on. Sorry, in two America. Days after I, sorry. sorry, Paul. Go ahead. Finish. No, go, go. No, go. go. No, 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 because I need you to finish because I was going to go in a different direction. 
I, I was just going to say that, you know, such train wrecks might be happening, but I was on a train journey 20, early 2020, and two days after I was on that train, it was one from um, the uh, border of New South Wales and Victoria down to Melbourne, uh, there was a train wreck mm. along a train line that's been running for well over 100 years. Never had a problem, and suddenly the train derails. Mm. Lack of maintenance, lack of money going into it by the people that bought it, quite literally, privatised. I was, We've got I was a lot also, of work to do to rebuild this thing. Yeah, oh, and yeah. In, a lot of, in a lot of the rural parts of America, they, they, they have this incredible identity still with agriculture, which is great because I like that. I like farming and I like small farms and everything, but it, ha it shouldn't be so streamlined into that focus on agriculture. It should be including manufacturing of not <laughs> raw materials that are indigenous to the country. Not necessarily agricultural products, but. I mean, we laugh about it, but every time you buy something new in a Western country, you only have to look at the label, made in China. My dear Paul, try to create an Australian aristocratic oligarchy. That's my advice. This is what, this is what annoys the hell out of me, because when I was growing up, there were such people in politics, or at least... And on both sides of politics, too. That was the, the interesting thing about it. There were people that did seem to have the interests of the nation in the forefront yes. of their thinking with everything but, that they did and everything that they said, and that has just disappeared. Everything that politicians say now, they, they, they just they speak it without really meaning it. Paul, another question for you. For an aristocratic oligarchy to appear in Australia, what entity do we have to neutralize? And it's an acronym with A letters. <laughs> I was going to say the CIA because they've had a hand in uh, a lot of oh, nefarious activities but, in Australia. Uh, the CIA is under that stuff. Yeah, United Nations. No, mm. the KFC as I am. Come on. I knew oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay yeah, okay, yeah. I'm just going to say on. that. I, I've got to CIA, try and commit. The I've CIA got to commit that is... one to memory, mate. I've got to commit that one to memory. The cacistocracy yeah, is what I'll call it. Yes. You know they're using mealworms in the breadcrumbs? No. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The CIA China. is just a tool. It's good that at least China is doing good because it sounds like from the um, uh, from the uh, uh, one of the other episodes where the guy was talking about China, it sounds like they're they're due. Yeah, I mean, they really had that. It was just really bad what was done to them. So I'm happy for China. Yeah, but I, I, I think you're right in part, Helen, but it's not enough to be victims. On the contrary, you should oh, not yeah. be you should not be victims. You, you can be victimized. But if you are a victim in your identity, you will never rise again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and My it's dream. not and it's not against your point, but that's it's very important epistemologically mm -hmm. on the country because the Chinese people always had that aristocratic oligarchy that they managed to change their destiny. Mm -hmm. Which is why kids in China aspire to be astronauts and kids in America want to be KFC you because, know, re because, retail folk. Because yeah. I guarantee you, if you have a history of 4,000 years, it is absolutely normal that you would have some period of your history that you would be down. Mm -hmm. But what would make you rise again, and I'm sorry to be a pirate, that's the aristocratic oligarchy yeah. maintaining the capacity to transfer again and again and again the classical education and the epistemological growth. It's really the hard because the... Alive. You know, with the education system being so hijacked, I mean, I mean, every every local community would have to like take it back, and all the adults that don't know like correct history, everything. So, so uh, you okay. you know what I'm saying? It's almost like where the heck yeah. Do so, you so I I wouldn't decide to be a pain in the ass tonight. The U.S. is only a 250 years old nation. If you have that kind of attitude after 250 years, I don't guarantee you wouldn't see your first millennium. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. All right. China has a lot to be thankful for, Quan, and his name is uh, begins with the letter C. Yeah. 
Oh, they, yeah. Oh, yeah. Confucius, oh, yeah. of course. Con Confucius. I mean, we, we keep talking in, in sort of Western terms when it comes to politics and everything like that. And I know we've had a, uh, uh, you know, a devotion to uh, Plato Platonic thinking in our readings and everything. But, but I just can't help but come back to whenever I think of China and what you're saying now, you know, the rise of the aristocratic man, all of that. I mean, that's a philosophical term that we may have learned in the platonic thinking, but it's very much Confucianism as I understand it. Mm -hmm. But I want I, I want I want to be nice with the Westerners. Probably that your bastard, <laughs> probably that your bastards are more dangerous than ours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Historically, our bad guys are more evil than your bad guys. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. with, with, with with the exception of the Mongols, perhaps I would agree with that. Yeah, but they're too dumb. They have been get. Uh, they, they have yeah. been uh, uh, down with after seventy five years. But uh, yes, I think but... that you. Uh, but I think that your plutocrats are much, much more dangerous. Yeah. To be frank, in regard to the Mongols, it's uh, it's not so much that they were smarter or anything like that. It's just that they were damned effective. And one of the reasons I say that is some years ago I remember reading a genetic study that showed that what was it eighty percent of all Europeans have some sort of Mongolian. Um, marker in their, their, yeah. their DNA, which just shows you how far Genghis Khan and, uh, you know, um, the, the, the oh, Mongol invasion oh, of Europe I, stretched. Oh, I yeah. see, I see. So the fact that you put plutocrats are so evil must be the Mongol genes. No, no, no. It's despite those Mongol genes. <laughs> That's what I would be saying. Despite that <laughs> beneficent influence, if you like, Clan. Do you I'll call it a beneficent the Chinese influence. having a different language? Uh, than um, English, you know, may have been an advantage? Uh, probably, I, I think. The fact that our aristocratic oligarchy managed... First, China is a very big place, okay? Let's not forget that. So when uh, the British came to China on the coastal area, uh, the old families went into the inland and they still had the academy and they kept on the classical education and so on. So they were waiting for their time, of course. They, they knew that, uh, they that the British would live one day. Okay, you, you know when the British took Hong Kong in 1842? Oh, not 1842, yes, 1842. Uh, Viceroy uh, Li Hongqiang made them sign a paper that uh, for the, the lease of uh, 1899 for 90, uh, 100 years or 99 years, because he knew that it would take about four generations for the Chinese to be powerful enough to take back Hong Kong. So mm -hmm. uh, I, once again, okay, I know that I always repeat that there's no magical uh, solution. Mm -hmm. Classical education, epistemological growth, aristocratic oligarchy, and you better change your attitude for victimhood because if you want to see your first millennium, uh, after 250 years, you cannot have that kind of attitude. <laughs> Unfortunately, they do. Well, what I what I really appreciated was uh, the the method of William Gilpin, um, who was very very much uh, a champion of this this method of thinking and and this way of promoting political economy that that we've been studying. And William Gilpin is somebody who really zeroed in early on on uh, the Chinese Confucian uh, system. And within his writings, he's, I think, the most clear uh, in, in his recognition that it's only by redefining America, not as the newest, but as rather uh, the effects of the... He actually, he, he playfully polemicizes that America is actually the, one of the oldest civilizations because he's seeing it from the standpoint of a direct continuity of China. And he's got this whole idea of the isothermal zodiac theory of the evolution of civilization from the standpoint of uh, Alexander von Humboldt, who generated this whole system viewing this this manifest destiny idea of marching marching west. So he had this concept that there is a continuity uh, from China to e and Egypt to Europe through to the Americas, and that it was thus America's destiny to go beyond and open up the West with the with rail development. But for the purpose of being able to have commerce uh, with China, and, and he wasn't talking about the opium war stuff, although some people who were promoting that were also thinking money, money off of opium. But he had a, uh, he was very clear in his writings that um, it's through the Chinese constitution and uh, Confucianism specifically that we we will find the seeds of our own renewal and rejuvenation. And uh, he's he's really, really good on that. 
And today, nobody really um, recognized that. And he's the champion. He's like known as the the uh, the father of manifest destiny. So the 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 best expression of manifest mm-hmm. destiny was was really led by him as an early father of the the transcontinental railway. Like twenty five years before Lincoln even began it, he was already organizing across the continent for that. So that uh, with without that idea, um, there really was no. I don't see any evidence that it would have ever happened to begin with, which is just a very interesting irony. Yeah, I -hmm. suppose that a combination of many powerful nations would be needed to bring down the KFC as I am. So I entirely approve your comment, Matt. That being said, Americans have been made really, really dumb. (laughs) We've fallen really far intellectually from the level of epistemological uh, depth and profundity of, of Gilpin. But, you know, the fact that we can still bring these ideas back, discuss them, and the fact that you have... Uh, figures like Trump and and Bobby Kennedy and others who are able to to make a populist movement based on something very rational is is also I think a sign that there's there's <laughs> a a hope a hope for renewal even now uh, at this yeah. late stage of decay. Well, yeah, we all not, hope not just it. Americans that have been dumbed down. Oh yeah, That's, I know. Oh, yeah, I know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of people, let's say. Okay, yes. and it's the last time tonight that we can bother you guys with that. So we have to start with an oligarchy with aristocratic attitude. Yes, yeah. correct. I agree. Guys, all right. I love our little aristocratic club here. This is good. This is good. So let's uh, let's keep this up uh, this this Sunday. Like I said, we have Fox Green who's going to do something on nuclear power. He's going to do some critical stuff as well on Bobby Kennedy's blind spots on uh, on on agricultural policy and uh, what natural uh, agriculture w- uh, is and is not. So Fox Green's going to going to do some some interesting stuff, and uh, that'll be on Sunday. And then we'll meet back on Wednesday to go into a prop. Uh, like the quick last question, part. Matthew. Hmm? I think it was Michael Claridge that did a presentation last Sunday. I didn't upload it yet, but but I'm going to upload it in okay. two or three days. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that one. Cool. All right, guys. Okay. Thank no you. Worries. Thank you. Thank no. you. Thank you. Fun as always. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.